kind of a place that's nowhere and the, the name really reflects that even though the name itself isn't that unique because there are other no man's lands over the country but it is really appropriate. It's right on the border, it's right on the county border, it's right on the border of the New Forest. It's village, it, the, the post address is Wiltshire but the village green is in Hampshire. So I'm on the village green and I was just trying to work out where the county boundary goes, which I think is the same as where the forest boundary is. And the, the, this is the road that will take you up to Lanford up that way and into Salisbury uh, along the A36. But the boundary doesn't actually go along the road, as far as I'm aware. I think it's the other side of that small bit of green, which is on the other side of the road. So we will, we'll go over that and, uh, and have a look in a minute. But I think it, it goes right in front of those houses. It might even cut across some of their gardens. I'm not sure. So I think the boundary runs along here somewhere. Yeah, so I think over that way towards the War Memorial is Hampshire. As soon as you cross the Castle Grid, you'll be in Wiltshire. And No Man's Land has its War Memorial over here, which I think was put up after the First World War. And it's just, I just think it's kind of quite curious that a village can be in, in one county and one parish and have its, it build its war memorial in another parish. It's like, that's no man's land. <laughs> well, those, there's some um, very familiar names in there, Dibden. It's very, there was a lot of Dibdens when I was at school here. Yeah, White, Carter, I think I remember, Chandler, that's quite a common name here. So I guess they're families that have been here a long time. Well, I'd like to wander down there, which is where the school is, and where my old house is. Be cool, walk to school. <laughs> And at one point, when the, when the school was first built, that was in a different parish. And No Man's Land itself has been in, uh, initially it was in no parish at all. And then it was in Redlinch Parish, and, then, and now it's in Lanford Parish. So it's kind of really confused. It, it was basically a squatter village. It was squatted by, well, the person we know about was a charcoal burner. And he built a house there in the late 18th century. Charcoal burner has tales to turn He lives in the forest alone in the forest This cottage is called Boundary Cottage. Apparently this was the site of the very first house in No Man's Land. So John Shergold, who built his house here, who then was allowed to keep it, and that was the beginning of No Man's Land. Apparently this is where he built his house. Probably wasn't that actual house, but I believe it was on that site. And it's, it's quite interesting that it's at a slight angle to both this road and that road, which may suggest that it predates the roads. 
possibly. Then in 1802, I think it was, there was a group of royal commissioners coming down to sort out some legal issues in the forest. One of which was to um, sort out some alleged breaches of the boundary where people had enclosed on the new forest boundary, which was the king's land. So these were part, I think they were parliamentary commissioners. Um, so, they, so they went through all these cases of where it had been alleged that people had encroached on the forest and claimed bits of land that was actually the king's land. And they came to this case of this fella called John Shergold in no man's land. Um, and it, it was claimed by some that this was the king's land. And it was claimed by other people that it was the Bishop of Winchester's land, which started just beyond the forest. But when they came to decide the case, they decided there was no clear evidence whether he was in the forest or in the Bishop of Winchester's land. And there was no clear evidence about where one began and the other finished. So they let him off. And they said, oh, well, we don't know who, who that land belongs to, so your house can stay there. And then immediately the, the word got out that there was a rush of people, you can imagine, to claim land because there was free land it didn't belong to anyone so it must have been a bit like the wild west for a few months people were just pitching up and putting up tents and fence fences to claim a little bit of land and that's how no man's land started so it started on a very specific date which was that court case that was decided that john shergold could keep his house which was on the 23rd of october 1802 found this boundary stone which I which wasn't here when I, I was a kid it says 2002 on it and it's to commemorate the bicentenary of no man's land and it says it's based on the original western boundary so I'm guessing this must be where the Bishop of Winchester's land started so we've just come from that direction which is where the green is so I'm guessing that all the land between here and the green was the land that nobody owned. Well, nobody could prove they owned. And so that's where the village was founded. So the relationship between the people who lived in the village and the forest is a little bit uncertain as well. I mean, for the forest, um, most of it is king's land, was king's land. It's, it's well, it's still Crown land, but it's run by the Forestry Commission now. But not all of it, so bits of it within the forest are privately owned. Um, but on the actual forest bits, there are people, commoners who have rights to, to use that land in certain ways, often usually for grazing or sometimes for collecting firewood or, or other rights. Digging turf, I think, was one of them. But the people who lived in no man's land wouldn't have had those rights because they, they were attached to certain old properties and still are in the village. Certain farms who would have traditionally had those rights to graze their animals on the forest. And that wouldn't have applied to anyone in no man's land, who, which was new. But in the school log, there are records of the school being closed or a lot of children being off to collect things from the forest, so things like wood or acorns or leaves, whether it's for their own use or whether they were being paid to do it on behalf of someone who did have rights to use the forest in that way, I don't know, or whether they were just permitted to do it even though they didn't have rights, which is quite interesting. Yeah, it's an interesting place.